What happens if we win? Are we prepared? Is anyone prepared? And I'm not talking about sports teams, business competition, or anything like that. This is a public policy and political video channel where we discuss the political process and the sometimes crazy experiences that we have with an emphasis on my home state of Washington. So I'm doing this video because of a frequent question that has come up with activists and policy wonks over the years. And I recently had this discussion while speaking to a group of activists in North Seattle. And this really isn't a partisan question, but it has partisan overtones. I care about freedom and liberty, both of which are concepts hated and attacked by the Democratic Party in our state. And of course, the only political party with anyone elected to office in our state that accepts these fundamental human rights concepts as kind of part of their belief system is the Republican Party at this point in time. Doesn't make them perfect, but that's where it is. So now we are facing what appears to many of us as crazier and crazier times. The crazies are often elected to office and the policies that they support and enact result in the very predictable self-immolation that we all can predict. Instead of making any serious effort to stop the dissent, it truly appears that the dominant political faction controlling the Democratic Party in our state today, it's really decided to double down on dumb and just put their foot on the gas pedal. So the inevitable result of clown world policies are easy to find all around us. The escalating and absurd crime wave, the total collapse of any pretense of an education system, the corruption of most government agencies, the proliferation of drug addiction as a subsidized lifestyle, and the open willingness to celebrate self-destructive and harmful public policies that just clearly destroy public safety, impoverished communities, and crush the quality of life which most aspire to achieve. So listen, anyone who is literate and not high on drugs can look around and see for themselves the willful damage done to our communities, particularly in the cities. And I don't need to provide you all the details, and for the purpose of this video, the laundry list is not important right now. What we are observing being implemented all around us in such a corrupt and incompetent kind of clownish manner is leading to some type of reckoning. It is clearly needed because it's clearly unsustainable. And this means that change is inevitably coming. Now the question is, what type of change? And that is the question for sure. Many believe we face at some point soon an apocalyptic crash that collapses our society back to some type of lawless Mad Max, The Walking Dead, Hunger Games type scenario. Bunker up, arm up, and be prepared for the apocalypse, right? But to be fair, this is always a possible outcome. However, as much as our current crop of political insiders and grifters seem to be attempting to achieve this type of outcome, and I'd have to do a whole series of stories on the crazy clown goals of the left someday, my conservative take on the most likely outcome is a bit less apocalyptic. And don't get me wrong, if you want to prepare for the worst, bunker up, stock up, and be prepared. You can be my guest, and you could certainly do far worse things like support Bob Ferguson for governor. However, I suspect if history is any guide to the echo of our future, which I believe it is most influenced, by the drama of the past. I suspect that we are far more likely to see some type of major political swing that results in the replacement of our existing political class. It's happened many, many times before, and sometimes even dramatically, since we live in a state where every major policy fiasco that's unfolding before our eyes is being directed, cheered, and supported by Democrats the most likely result of a political replacement would involve new people who are affiliated with the Republican Party. Now, they could accidentally stumble into political victory. And this scenario is what I believe merits discussion in this video today. Now, before I get to it, however, I wanna remind you to like this video, hit the subscribe button if you don't yet subscribe and leave your comments below on why I'm wrong and what I have missed. I really do enjoy your comments, even the ones that disagree with me, and I try to read all of them, and I do my best to respond. Feel free to share this video with others who might have good feedback as well. None of this costs you anything but a few seconds of your time, and yet it can have a very positive impact on the reach of our channel in videos like this one. So, okay, back to the Republicans. Uh, despite themselves, they may accidentally win political power in Washington state, but what would they do? Does anyone have a plan? And that 
a real plan that involves actually more than just a fearful, hand-wringing bewilderment about how to be a slightly less crazy version of the clowns who currently occupy the halls of political power in our state. And unfortunately, the answer to that question, of course, is no. There is no plan for victory or what to do after victory. Maybe there's a nebulous plan for trying to get reelected, but frankly, this vision, if anyone has it right now, it's dim and fuzzy at best. And partly this is because of most of the Republican uh, political leadership. They just have some variation, I believe, of Stockholm Syndrome, and they can't really imagine running state government. Partly this is because very few of them can even conceive of what it looks like to lead a government like Washington State. And most absurdly and frustratingly, this is partly because most Republican leaders spend nearly all of their time worrying about who is king of their partisan molehill and infighting tends to rule the day. It is comfortable, lazy, and easy to fight with those who you know best rather than to take on the much more formidable task of trying to address the bigger problems of the state. And by the way, this is actually a common problem with political groups who exist and wander in the political wilderness. It's not unique to the Republicans of Washington State. So now this brings me to the solutions portion of this video and probably what I think is the most important part. First, I want to remind you that my, basically any of my viewers, anybody watching this video, that liberty and freedom is really too important for us to, and for future generations really, to entrust it to a political party or to any other group and just presume that they're going to protect it and nurture it. They will not. This isn't because they're evil or have some grand plot to quash freedom and liberty. It's just because the nature of man is such that when you live in a nominally free society, and we are still semi-free, I suspect people who have power, they tend to shift their priorities to much more prosaic short-term concerns that really tend to result in navel-gazing, blame-shifting, selfish efforts to build sand castles, and projection on others. Now, don't get angry at people who won't do for you what you refuse to do for yourself. And this is really just a waste of time. So here's my suggestion and something that I've been thinking about for some time now. We really can't presume someone else is putting together a plan for what happens if we accidentally win political power in this state. They're not, but we should make a plan ourselves. And this is a worthwhile and useful exercise for a variety of reasons that I'm going to explain now. First, if we have a plan, and it really consists of a variety of focus plans for success, when we find ourselves in that position, we will at least have a starting place for how to govern a state with as much untapped potential and willful neglect as our state has suffered. In the absence of any serious plan, the one that already exists is the most likely one to see some level of implementation. Secondly, uh, this is really needed because if we don't have a plan, then the voters and the people who will have just changed government because of their disgust with the clownish corruption, they're going to be unable to distinguish the difference of governance if all a, a new political crew does is kind of rearrange the deck chairs on the deck of the sinking Titanic. The people, these are real people, the people who cross over to boot out the crazies, they're not gonna be doing so because they care about the political party with which you label yourself. They're actually looking for change. And a new crop of politicians must be able to deliver very clear and obvious changes. And those changes better be significant enough to have a positive impact on the state. Because if they're not, the success will be for nothing. The voters will be even further discouraged and the corrupt kind of blob of bureaucracy will just be the quagmire that ensures inevitable decline is the result anyway, maybe a bit slower than under the crazies that we replace. Now, thirdly, the exercise of studying state government is actually worthwhile because if you plan to make change, you must understand what you plan to change. It is almost a, certain, a certainty, really, that with a freedom, liberty oriented change in government, it will be mandatory to make some very major changes to the structure, the size, the scope, and kind of the nastiness of the existing bloated administrative state. And this is not easy, but it is far more possible if you actually understand from the beginning the goal, the process, and the specific outcome for each part of the bureaucracy. This is actually a good use of time to study, debate, and plan exactly what must be done to clean things up in advance. 
It is this third reason that I will explore as kind of a thought exercise here and hopefully inspire others to engage in discrete, focused areas of state government so that a plan can actually begin to come together as an option, just in case, despite these self-destructive tendencies that a new government sweeps into political power, despite that, we want to have some kind of a plan to make a difference. Now, the, the challenge really from an ideological standpoint is that most people probably watching this video right now, and certainly most conservative liberty-oriented activists that I work with, we don't tend to like government. It's just not our passion. And this is understandable because in our view, really, rightly in most cases, government and bureaucracy, uh, basically it's easy to see them with skepticism, disdain, and fear because the tools of suppression, harassment, and kind of the destruction of freedom and liberty, they do tend to come from the bureaucracy. Just like no individual snowflake ever blames itself for the avalanche, no individual bureaucrat or politician will blame themselves for the collective harm that they inflict on our communities and yet they do so nonetheless. So carrying on with the avalanche analogy, we can reduce the damage by reducing the buildup of snow in the first place. And so studying government, the bureaucracy, the agencies, the grant grifters, and the people who run them is worthwhile so that we can best identify what changes are absolutely required if we happen to get into political power. Now, those of us who believe in liberty and individual freedom are right to be suspicious of big government, but we should not be ignorant of it. And particularly how it works. We will want to downsize the Leviathan that we have created and which has bloated itself at the cost of previous generations of treasure and parasitical self-serving behavior. But by studying and planning for this inevitable downsize event, we can definitely craft a plan that is thoughtful, that's effective, that's logical, and most likely to prevent tossing out the baby with the bathwater in the whole process. Now, when I've studied parts of Washington state or local governments in the past, it is easiest and very worthwhile to identify the agencies or departments that if they were to vanish tomorrow, basically no honest person would notice or care. These are the parts of government that are so worthless, harmful, or destructive that no real merit can be found. And the world will be a better place to shut them down and stop that appendage from metastasizing any further. Sometimes it is clear to everyone, like putting the Evergreen State College out of its misery and just saving future generations from the harm inflicted by that institution. Sometimes it is minor, like just eliminating the Puget Sound Partnership, because would anyone really even notice the difference? In other cases, agencies need to be rationally downsized, retaining only the parts that actually provide tangible, useful benefit. For example, in the Department of Transportation, we still need road and bridge maintenance, probably significant increases actually in the amount of work put into both, not to mention congestion relief, something they've removed as a priority just a few years ago. However, there are vast sums of money that are squandered and diverted to projects that benefit special interests, but not the people who actually need to move around the state. It's also worthwhile to note that grant grifting has become a big business in government today. It's probably one of the biggest businesses there. Our state and local governments have created rivers of cash, just rivers, that are funneling cash just to entirely unaccountable, nonprofit and for-profit entities that really exist only to ensure that they fail to solve the problem that they pretend they exist to solve in the first place. The most obvious examples of this are really the entire homeless industrial complex in our state, and you can find plenty of similar examples in the Enviro side of the grant grifting machine. You freeze on grants, for example, creating better auditing and transparency functions as policy, these are all general ideas that can start us on a path to rationalize and probably significantly downsize massive expenditures that are almost entirely wasted today. Now, on the other hand, there is a clear deficit in our state providing, for example, essential services for those who are suffering mental illness. Recent administrations with outright democratic hostility towards mental health services have pretty much ensured that the optimal solution right now to these problems has been to dump those who need help the most onto the streets of our cities with a free tent and needles and a pat on the back. Probably two of the most efficient areas of rational public policy in Washington state today can be found in the state's approach to drug addiction and mental health, for example. So it's highly likely for, uh, as another example here, just highly likely that the top three layers at least 
of nearly every state agency consists of politically appointed or approved bureaucrats who are so fossilized in their positions that any new administration who retains that leadership is simply asking for sabotage and failure. There are many good workers in state and local government. I live in Thurston County and some of them are my neighbors. But they are usually to be found in the front lines of government work where the real work is sometimes conducted. And this is very different than at the upper levels of the bureaucratic bloated state where political connections, wokeness, and corruption is the currency used to advance to their positions. And it might be possible to find some exceptions to this view, but you can only find them if you study them now, in advance, because after an electoral upset, all these guys will be trying to pretend that they suddenly care about the people, they believe in math, and an effort to keep their jobs, their undeserved jobs. So it's better to study them now and get a pretty good idea of what we're dealing with. I really don't need to provide more examples. There's plenty of them out there. And we only have so much time to discuss these in a video like this. However, I'm hoping that this video inspires politicians and activists to perhaps reconsider how they view the state and the bureaucracy. Political change is inevitable. And at some point it's coming. And some of us should be planning for that success. Whenever that day comes, rational, practical, and effective plans for downsizing the bloat in government are worth developing now. Finding the people who actually care about these subject matters and who are experts on one slice or another of the kind of government bureaucratic pie, find them now is a worthwhile exercise. Debating these plans while well, we have time to plan in advance is always better than just trying to implement something by the seat of your pants after being tossed into the cauldron of chaos that a new administration would probably represent. So let me close with just some suggestions, and I think these apply particularly to those who want to be a part of a solution at some point, and not just spend your time moping around in depression and drama, planning for the apocalypse that's always just around the corner. Number one, pick a part of government and study it. There are hundreds of pieces of our state bureaucracy and local government. Find the ones that interest you. Study them. Learn how they work. Find out what they do. Just find out if they do anything well or if they do anything worthwhile. Learn who is in charge and what cuts could be made without impact on regular people. This is very worthwhile and a good exercise, I think, to do. Number two, find others who share your passion and compare notes. You might find common themes, uh, appreciate a different take, and then the debate that you have that ensues from that kind of collaboration, that can produce a plan that's much more effective than the original one that you might have just drafted on your own. You can also find others who are doing the same thing with the agencies that they're studying and kind of compare. This is essentially how you start to stitch together a plan that a future governor or legislature could use as a roadmap to reform in the future. And then finally, and hopefully this is obvious, write it all down. Make it possible to share, critique, and save. As time goes by and the new information is collected, this can be updated by you or by somebody else. But no matter what, if you want to make a difference in this state, you're going to have to get involved. You're going to have to show up because the future belongs to those who show up.